So, great. All right, um, I think I'm gonna to uh, kind of walk through a report for you after I turn this on. Uh, you may remember that we established a, a working group of our council um, about two years ago or so to, uh, to address genomic medicine and, and the efforts that we were uh, undertaking to kind of move that forward. Um, and we give a report to you every uh, year, and so September is the time that we do that, so that's what this report is about. Um, just to take some of you who, who may not um, be aware, uh, certainly everybody's aware of the strategic plan if you've come in this room more than once, um, but uh, in, in terms of how the, the genomic medicine working group came about, it came from, from the strategic plan. Uh, we recognized that there were things that the institute had not been doing in the past in terms of, of uh, uh, disease and genomics, and these were the kinds of things that we wanted to do in that. Uh, so these were kind of the goals that are outlined in the strategic plan for um, uh, the genomic applications in medicine. Uh, and then there are some specifics here and, and some initial steps, that all of which were, were in the plan. Uh, you may remember about a year ago we brought to you a definition of genomic medicine, um, and this was uh, primarily an emerging medical discipline involving genomic information about an individual as part of their medical care. Uh, and it was a purposefully narrow definition, and we explained why that was. So that's kind of what we're calling genomic medicine. Uh, I, I heard earlier this morning that there was a little bit of confusion as to the various domains in our strategic plan, particularly the fifth one, uh, which is improving the effectiveness of healthcare. I have to admit that's probably not the best name for it. I think initially we had talked about, you know, using it in clinical care or using genomics in clinical care. Um, and, and it kind of morphed into, into this, as, as will often happen in committees. Um, and these are kind of the kinds of things that are in the plan that, that are described for that. Can you hear me? Or no? uh, okay, so I was supposed to, they told me to put it on the right so that when I turn, so I will do this, and then I know that you'll hear me. Um, so hopefully that's a, a little bit better. Um, so what's in the plan is uh, things such as delivering genomic information to clinicians and patients. So that's not educational material, that's that patient's information for use in their clinical care, and that's probably the main aspect that, that makes uh, something into domain five. Demonstrating effectiveness, so if you do that, do outcomes differ? Uh, and if it's effective, our outcome's better. Uh, educating healthcare professionals, patients, and the public. Um, there is a part of the strategic plan that's, that's specifically dedicated to education and training, and that's become a cross-cutting area, but this was an, an area as well um, in this domain. Uh, and increasing access to genomic medicine. There's a lot of concern that this will only be available to, uh, to the elite or um, those who are near particular medical centers, et cetera. Um, so are, might there be ways to increase the role of non-geneticist healthcare providers, which is something that we're, we're working very actively in, uh, perhaps using telehealth medicine or enhancing genomic education for future healthcare providers. Uh, we established this uh, group in about September of uh, 2011. Um, and their, their initial goal were to help us to plan what we were calling, you know, sort of listening sessions or consultations with um, the community that was doing this kind of work. At the time, we thought that community was small and we wanted to help it become bigger. Um, and so the idea was to have meetings two to three times per year in this area and also to provide guidance to us in other areas of implementation, such as what are the infrastructural needs, um, how can we identify related efforts for future collaborations, and, and can we review progress and, and uh, next steps. Uh, so this is the uh, current makeup of the, of the genomic medicine group. We've been in existence for about two years. We haven't had people rotate off, but we probably do need to do that at some point. You'll notice several uh, former council members on this list, uh, and uh, uh, Howard Jacob is our, our current uh, council member uh, representative. Uh, we began this effort with a colloquium in June 2011, a, a meeting in Chicago that I've described to this group before. Uh, it was basically a, an outreach to many groups that we happen to be aware of. We're using or beginning to use genomic information in clinical care, not the, the cancer aspects since we knew that a lot of places were doing that, but more uh, some of the more complex diseases and other things. Um, and we asked them to help us kind of define the landscape uh, and to, to develop an implementation roadmap that other groups who were thinking of getting into this area might be able to follow. Um, and then uh, identify common infrastructure and research needs. Um, out of this, we were gr very grateful to have the, the group actively participate in, in uh, coming up with a summary that was published recently in Genomics and Medicine. Um, and it's, it's been a, uh, that was a, a, a very useful e exercise to go through. 
from that came a number of things that we recognized we really need to do. And the first thing was that we, we found that there, each one of these groups were getting genomic results back and were saying, my goodness, what is it we should report to patients and clinicians? What shouldn't we? And they all had committees that basically were sitting down and trying to figure this out. And we said, well, gee, um, seems like many of us are coming to the same conclusions. Couldn't we do this in a more systematic way and, and make it more effective? Um, so that led to the, what we called the Clin Action Workshop, led by Aaron Ramos. Um, just a few months after the, the June meeting, in fact, uh, and the idea of that was to consider processes and resources to identify clinically relevant variants and decide whether they're actionable and what the action should be. Um, and from this, uh, uh, there were several discussions in council about uh, initiatives in this area. Uh, then we, we did go forward with the clinically relevant variants resource that was, uh, that was discussed in council in May and is just about to be awarded once the, the uh, paperwork can be done. Um, we followed that uh, actually two days later with a general, more general genomic medicine meeting, the second meeting, which was really designed to identify potential collaborations among uh, the various uh, academic sites that were doing these things. And, um, and also we, we brought a few institutional leaders in and said, okay, in the places where this has been effectively implemented, what was it that was convincing to you and how, um, how might we, you know, help others uh, to, to uh, make those, those cases. So that was a, a useful one and followed about six months later in Chicago um, to look at, at the initial groups that we had brought together to try to develop some collaborative pro projects as well as we brought together um, payers and other st stakeholders and got their input because one of the things that, that you wouldn't be surprised an institutional leader said is that a major barrier is that a lot of this isn't reimbursed. There are good reasons for it not being reimbursed. But we wanted to talk to the reimbursers and find out what would it take in order to get it to be reimbursed. Um, that was followed then by a payers meeting, which was held in, in October um, and was uh, specifically to identify the potential for collaborative research um, and possibly even joint funding. Uh, this is one that has, has taken a bit of a back burner to a, a number of other issues that are facing reimbursers at present, not the least of which is the Affordable Care Act, um, and we hope to be able to pursue it uh, uh, again before too long. So these were the meetings that, uh, that were, had either been held or, or um, that y'all, um, uh, we kind of gave you heads up about uh, at the last time that we updated you. Uh, it's one of my favorite Larson meeting slides, the Association of Prevar Prevaricators. Yesterday, I was told the meeting was today. Um, so luckily, we didn't have too many of those happen. Um, and in, in, uh, as we were holding meetings and, and listening and, and considering, we also were developing programs. And so there's a number of funding opportunities that were released just within the past year including the genomic medicine pilot demonstration products, both the sites and the coordinating center, the reissue of the clinical sequencing exploratory research coordinating center and clinical sites, uh, the clinically relevant var uh, variants resource, the CRVR, uh, the genome sequencing and newborn screening disorders that were just announced, as you saw on Eric's slide, um, and the coordinating center for the undiagnosed diseases network, which has become a common fund program to um, expand the, uh, IR, the intramural um, uh, undiagnosed diseases program into a, into a network. And in fact, uh, this one has had four um, um, solicitations for coordinating center, clinical sites, uh, sequencing core, and gene function studies, all within the space of, uh, of a few months. And so the, the folks working on this, particularly uh, Anastasia Wise, Carson Loomis, uh, Nick DiGiacomo, are doing a, a fabulous job in, on getting these things out. Um, in addition to uh, formal RFAs, we also were, were able to supplement some programs to kind of jumpstart uh, uh, new projects, and particularly a collaboration that we're very pleased with, uh, with the um, NIGMS-led Pharmacogenomics Research Network uh, and the Iner Emerge Network, <coughs> where, where the PGRN brings us a state-of-the-art um, pharmacogenomics array uh, and a variety of other uh, expertise, and we bring to them um, uh, more sort of real-world settings for doing pharmacogenomics as well as expertise in, in electronic phenotyping and privacy concerns. And you heard about that, I think, February or May or so. Um, so those, and those are, are in progress. Um, so those are the, the programs, getting back to meetings then, um, that uh, began uh, now since we had reported to you in January of uh, 2013, January of this year, we met in Dallas for our fourth uh, meeting. And this one was focused particularly on physician, on educating physicians in genomic medicine. Uh, this was organized by Mark Williams at Geisinger and Jean Passamani, a colleague here at NHGRI, and they, they did a wonderful job in, in recruiting eight Professional societies is shown there, as well as two accreditation councils, actually the major accreditation councils for physician education, both at the, at the resident level and at the, uh, sorry, at the, um, um, 
not the resident level, the, the medical school level, and, and then once people are finished with, with residency and out in practice. Um, there were very active discussions. Everybody sort of showed what materials they had, what challenges they're facing, et cetera, and, and a number of areas of consensus. Uh, one was that you're scaring physicians away by presenting this as a revolution. It really is an evolution. It's, you know, think of it as a lab test, and of course that breaks our heart. What do you mean, just a lab test? Um, but actually, it's, for, for most physicians, that, that is indeed what it is, particularly when you're only looking at one or two variants from that, that are clinically applicable at present. Uh, we were advised to uh, find ways to, or they all agreed that we should find ways to uh, embed genomics education at the point of care where possible um, with clinical decision support technologies, and you heard a little bit about that uh, earlier. Sharing genomics education materials produced by many societies amongst those societies. Now there obviously are some barriers to that and that it costs them a lot to put those materials together, and so what kind of a licensing or, or um, it, you know, it's possible to get a discount and those are conversations we're having. Um, utilizing other kinds of educational resources resources, are there checklists, are there ethical guidelines, um, uh, case studies, et cetera. Um, a, a strong consensus that if this is going to, to sort of make it with clinicians, it needs to be in their certification and licensing exams because there's already so much that's in those exams that they don't have time to really look at much of anything that isn't in those. Um, so obviously we wouldn't want to put things into, into exams that are not efficacious and, and important and applicable, and so working with the boards that develop these exams to, to figure out um, uh, what should be there is, is a, a, another issue. Uh, and allowing uh, uh, some specialty tailor training rather than general programs um, in genetics. So there were a, a lot of interest among oncologists, you know, isn't there a way to become an oncology genomicist or oncologic genomicist or, or could you be a, a genomic cardiologist or something, something along those lines where they wouldn't have to learn um, as much as, as is needed in, in many of the, the pediatric and developmental syndromes and things that really aren't relevant to many medical specialties but they still could get um, some kind of added um, uh, certification. There was also a strong feeling that we should develop a uh, coordinating committee among these societies, which we've hence dubbed the Inter-Society Coordinating Co Committee for Practitioner Education in Genomics. Um, and that group is, is really focusing first on physicians, not necessarily primarily on physicians, but because physicians, as Eric said this morning, have tended to lag behind uh, other um, ancillary medical personnel, we, we felt that that was a, a group that we really needed to focus on, and much of what um, uh, they might do, as well as what just much of what is being done in other um, uh, ancillary personnel such as uh, nurse practitioners, et cetera, physician's assistants would be relevant to each other, so sharing would be very important. Um, and so the charge to this group is to facilitate interactions among the societies to enhance their efforts at increasing the understanding and expertise of practitioners um, in using genomic uh, uh, results in <coughs> clinical care. Um, this is just sort of the structure and, and uh, how we, we plan to go about doing this. Um, and we've uh, kind of laid out about a dozen desiderata that we would, we would like at some point to be able to do. We picked four of those to start with, uh, and that's, uh, again, taking a, a bit of a, a page from Niche Peg's, Peg's book, Can We Identify Competencies for Physicians? You know, a physician needs to be able to read a genome sequence. Well, probably not. Um, but they, they probably do need to be able to interpret a candidate gene test or um, to know what tests to order or things like that. Um, so develop those competencies, uh, educational products, what's out there, what could be made available rapidly, what's the best way to make that available, what needs to be developed, uh, engaging specialty boards to determine which ones are really ready to incorporate this, why are they ready, what would help to make some of the others ready if, if that's appropriate. Um, and also developing use cases to kind of reach out to those who, who may feel that this isn't relevant to them to point out, oh, you know, when a patient comes in with uh, colorectal cancer and, and at an, particularly an early age, but not necessarily, um, there are important considerations for Lynch syndrome and family history and testing that uh, you should be aware of. Oh, well, I wasn't aware of that. So, so those kinds of things are, are what those groups are developing. And these are some metrics of success that we improve communications among the societies. Um, we uh, identify be best practices. We generate competencies. We you know, get good estimates of physician use that are increasing um, and, uh, and that there are uh, increasing interactions among other relevant efforts. 
Um, so uh, Eric, I think, showed you this list in, in text form. Uh, in blue, uh, what, are, what are added are, are those that have joined us. And, and almost all of these have approached us and said, we understand you're having this group. We'd really like to be part of it, which is fantastic. That's exactly what we were hoping for. Uh, and then these are the, the various institutes that are, are also uh, actively participating with us. We meet by conference call once a month. And uh, as Eric mentioned, we had a, a webinar meeting back in June because we couldn't clear the approvals in time in order to have an in-person meeting. Although so up until two weeks before, we kept hoping. But uh, we'll now be having a meeting um, uh, next in, in about two weeks or so uh, to, to do some of this work face to face. Uh, another favorite Larson cartoon, Innocent Care Free Stewart's left hand didn't know what the right was doing. And you see here a memo, tonight I strike death to the left hand, death, death. Um, <laughs> one of the things that you, that you find in the government is that often uh, you have left hand, right hand disease. And we certainly are, are accused of having that. Um, and so what we, we thought we would do next is to try to engage some of the other federal agencies that might be or perhaps should be working in this area, particularly in terms of implementation. Because NIH is a research arm. Um, obviously, research then bleeds into dissemination and implementation. But where does that become the role of other groups? And where can other groups kind of help out with that? Um, and so what we wanted to do was to engage the various agencies to discuss potential strategies for genomic medicine implementation, find out what they're currently doing, what obstacles they're in, in running into, identify some common interests and opportunities, and figure out how we could, we could collaborate. And this is basically the, the model that we've had for, for these meetings you know, um, uh, throughout when we started with the academic centers. We thought we would include groups who were doing direct medical care in the federal government. There's a, a fairly large care provider in the, uh, in the uh, Veterans Administration and another uh, probably even, perhaps even larger um, care provider in the military medical system. Uh, we actually got uh, all, all four of the military medical services and the Marines get their, their care through the Navy. Um, and we also included uh, the, the NIH. We like to think that we provide a little bit of medical care in our clinical center, um, even though that's tertiary care in general. Um, we also included groups that uh, are, are working on reimbursement and regulatory efforts, such as CMS, the Food and Drug Administration, AHRQ. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield is not a federal agency. Uh, I wasn't confused there. But they were very interested in, in attending and participating, and they were quite active. Uh, and then there are other groups that we might call sort of supportive, supportive or facilitative, such as the CDC, um, PCORI, the Patient Centers Outcomes Research Institute, uh, was there, um, two of the assistant secretaries uh, uh, staff, and the Institute of Medicine uh, Genomics Roundtable. So we spent two days really discussing kind of what are the opportunities and ways in which we could work together. Um, one thing that we did was to kind of extract major issues that, um, that actually have been identified by other countries. So there are in, in the UK and in, in Italy, and I believe there may be another on a blocking on, on which, um, there uh, are already sort of published strategies for how one can implement uh, genomics in medical care. Um, these are some major components of them, and these were things that were identified in our meetings. And we just asked the various agencies, what, which of these are key for you? And, and we included our list there, so you can see AHRQ up at the, the top left. Um, and, and for us, all of these were important issues, as for the VA. Um, and then there were some that were really you know, quite highly relevant to, to just about everybody. So equitable access is one of those sort of motherhood and apple pie that everybody agreed we want to be sure there's equitable access. But it's not kind of something that you can just make happen. You have to do these other things, and then hopefully um, it, will, it will help be helped to come along. Um, but evidence of clinical validity and utility was, was pretty much far and away um, the big issue in this field. And how do we generate that kind of evidence? And um, it's not there now, and we really do need that. Um, so given that that was a, um, a concern, we talked about uh, are, are there potential projects in evidence development that we could work on together? The military medical services were actually very, very enthusiastic about this, and um, uh, at the, the VA as well. Uh, the VA, as you know, has a number of programs already ongoing. How they might be able to collaborate uh, with us and with uh, the DOD is, is a topic for discussion for, uh, again, later this month, uh, where we can look at potential projects to find some obstacles um, eventually. But, but first, we wanted to kind of discuss, is this even possible, um, engage scientific and clinical content experts in it, project design, and we may be calling on some of you if, if this goes forward, and explore the potential for funding, because this probably wouldn't be a simple thing to, uh, to get funded. Um, we also have discussed with the NIH leadership, and we'll be um, talking with the, the leadership of the, of the many institutes uh, about what we should be doing NIH-wide, because as we've discussed, uh, very 
often, you know, as, as soon as you get a little bit down the road in terms of implementation, you get very disease specific. And so those are things that we, we would want to, to work closely with the disease specific institutes or have them take the lead in and, and you know, we can, we can play a supportive role. Um, so again, we'll be talking about current efforts, looking at challenges and common needs. Um, this is the, the kind of list of components that we've identified from the various uh, uh, international efforts, and you can, can see them listed up there. The Canada was the other one, I'm sorry, that I, I had forgotten. Um, as well as some um, more central U.S. bodies, such as the IOM uh, and the AMA. And again, looking at those that, that seem to be kind of uh, uh, commonly of interest, uh, bioinformatics infrastructure was one that was cited um, repeatedly by these groups, not so much by the federal agencies. Um, and uh, the health economics, cost effectiveness, and clinical validity and utility we saw as sort of being the same thing and again being this issue of, of uh, uh, utility. Um, so that was the fifth meeting um, and then recognizing that there are international efforts in this area and that we're trying to do something along these lines in the U.S. We thought it would make sense to bring together some of the international groups that are doing this work um, and so that's planned for January uh, here in Bethesda to again engage what they're doing, find out what they're doing, and, and where we might be able to collaborate. So far, the, uh, the invitations for this have just recently gone out, um, but we have you know multiple continents and, and about 15 representatives from about a dozen countries so far uh, who are interested in, in coming and. and we're, you know, we're not in a, in a position really to be able to pay much in the way of travel internationally. And so a lot of these folks are coming on their own dime and are actually willing to bring a couple of people from health ministries, from their universities, from their funding agencies, et cetera. So, so this should be a fun, uh, fun experience. Um, so just to kind of summarize what, you know, what we've done, this again, this is about this three-year um, process here. Uh, and looking at meetings, this was kind of the lead up. I, I should mention um, the, the DOGM, the Disease Oriented Genomic Medicine Working Group, which was one of three working groups that was uh, established after we, we put the strategic plan together. Uh, and Rick Wilson was a, a member of that. And I wanted to, to cite you, Rick, since we won't see you again. And we can't thank you again for, uh, for having done that, that work. Um, the, the consortium uh, meeting, the first meeting, was, was held in June. And then in about September, we had uh, the GMWG formed. and then. Lots and lots of meetings that are actually sort of increasing in, in pace, uh, it seems at least, um, to the point where, where we have need to back off a little bit because it, it's just too much for us to be able to handle. And it's also one of the reasons we've reached out to NIH as a whole and said, you know, we're just a little institute, we're doing our best, but, but really some of these things are, are things that we feel should be taken on for NIH as a whole. Um, so here's where we are today, and we have two meetings coming up in a couple of weeks, and then the January meeting in uh, 2014, and who knows what to follow. Uh, and then looking at the programs that have been initiated, these are the release of the various RFAs that I, I pointed out to you, um, as well as um, the awards, many of which you've seen and some of which you'll be seeing uh, at, uh, at the closed session today. So uh, just a, a final list of the programs that we have. Um, in, in genomic medicine, this is just a sampling of them. To give you an idea of the magnitude, uh, I've shown that the amount of dollars and the fiscal years th that are covered uh, the, in the small print at the bottom, you can see that the seven-year average for NHGRI is about $23 million a year invested in this area. It's going up slightly, not a great deal. Um, the um, uh, percentage of the budget is 6 to 7 percent, depending on which denominator you pick and project out into the future, and whether you include LC set-aside funds, some of which have been uh, dedicated to this. So I think that's it, except I'd like to, to uh, point out that, that all of the efforts in bringing forward these RFAs, getting them funded and awarded, et cetera, uh, are the work of many, many people. Um, and particularly uh, thank the review branch and grants management, uh, genomic medicine investigators, and those who, who come to these meetings and, and many of whom pay their own way and, and actively participate, and of course the genomic medicine working group. So I'll stop there and be happy to take questions. Terry, can you go back one slide? I just want to go back to that. I just want to ask, clarify a couple things. No, one more. The, the slide that showed all the Initiatives. Just to be clear, UDN being in parentheses, it's because it's not our dollars. I'm sorry, yes, yeah. I so, so we get we get partial credit for it, but it's not coming out of NHGRI m dollars. Yeah. Okay, and then the newborn sequencing, that's NHGRI's contribution. Yeah. It's being equally matched by by, by yeah. Child Health. Yeah. I don't know if there's it's any so other. No, so we, we've taken out, I should have explained yeah. that. So taken out, the, there, are, there are some co-funding in CSER. I believe that's the only other one 
um, CRV, or there was a discussion of it. I don't. There was a discussion, but I don't think it ever came to pass. And then uh, emerge PGX brokers dollars with G GMS. Right? I mean, you know, it's we, not. We're not totally on our own in pharmacogenomics area, right? That's a right. Well, we're using their tools, but they're not contributing funding. Okay. All right. Okay. And um, while I'm well, I have the microphone. I guess the other thing that you you started to point out that um, we realize that this growth area is is consuming us in some way. I mean, we don't even have staffing to follow up on all these things we're dealing with, national leaders, federal leaders, international leaders, and all that. We really feel we're setting the table and now all of a sudden realize we've put a feast in front of us that's even too big for us. Um, and we've reached out to NIH leadership because so much of what we're doing is on behalf of NIH. I mean, every institute's interested in all these things and I think they love it that we're leading, but it's also we just can't keep doing this. And so we've had um, uh, meetings with Francis Collins and other NIH leadership, including Kathy Hudson, and they realize that we've been an incredibly valuable reconnaissance team, but we can't carry the water on this forever um, because it's bigger than us. And um, uh, in fact, we this topic is going to um, you know, we get, we're getting two hours at the at an upcoming next month uh, um, retreat of institute directors. We do a big scientific retreat once a year or so, and. We got two hours. Terry is is collecting information from other institutes, what they're doing in this space, and we're going to have strategic discussion. We're doing this jointly with a couple other institutes in this two-hour discussion. But uh, and I don't know what will come out of it. But one thing that we hopefully will come out of it a recognition that if we're really going to effectively lead on behalf of NIH. We need more muscle from other institutes. And I'm, I'm not even just talking about dollars. I'm even just talking about staff time and and help with just carrying all these things forward. It's, big, it's getting bigger than us. So I just wanted to point that out. So, and, and building uh, the NIH leadership is receptive. I mean, the fact that we got on the agenda, got two hours, shows that they are very interested and appreciative about this. So, so um, thank you. This was great. Um, uh, I have a couple questions related to the amassing of data that could be mined, both for the genetic and just in general for health outcomes research. So I'm thinking particular P. Corey, P. Picori, and, and the projects that you talked about bringing together the sort of federal agencies. Is there a sort of task force that's working? Are these just conversations that are starting? Is that, you know, is that something that, I mean, because that to me sounds really exciting. You know, if, if we think about, again, you know, where the U.S. tends to not have the advantage, right? I mean, the U.K. has a centralized biobank and da, 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 but, you know, if we could bring in together some of the federal, that seems really exciting. Well, it does. And, and we learned, actually, one of the things that made this even more exciting was that the, the um, defense, the military medical services are, are all conglomerating um, in a few months, as I understand it, into the Defense <coughs> Health something agency, I think DHA. Um, and they are eager and already at working closely together. So, so that's, you know, basically four big medical practices. Well, one that's kind of small, Coast Guard, um, but, the, but the other three are quite large that have huge numbers of people because remember they you know once somebody's been in the military after 20 years they get their medical care for life as do their their dependent spouses and um, children up to a certain age um, so so that's a you know really large swath of the of the population and so we were thinking this might be a way to kind of galvanize and energize the the other agencies to kind of come in with us if they see that this is something we can pull off I you know recognizing that there are huge issues in terms of sharing and plus there are security concerns and privacy issues and Remember that, that the military is not covered by GINA, um, so, so there, are, there are major obstacles to this. But we thought, let's give it a try. Let's see what we could come up with and kind of go from there. Thank you, Terry. That was really interesting. Um, I have a question that might be too specific, but if you have come across this. So in terms of the um, collaboration with DOD, uh, a lot of the research that DOD, some of the research that DOD has been interested in in genomics has um, the potential and, and I think on their part even a stated interest of um, going far beyond what more medically oriented service or uh, agencies would do in terms of pushing these things to enhancement and pushing these things to be able to use the knowledge that they gain to select people for certain kinds of jobs. And so they, they just have a very potentially, I mean, some of it is very similar to what everybody else is interested in in terms of medicine. But they have a whole other 
sphere of their of their motivation for this. And I'm just curious if that's come up or if people have thought about that. To some degree, more in, in terms of a readiness issue and, and more, I think, in terms of, of, you know, is this really that big a readiness issue for them? There are many other things that they, you know, they need to be concerned about sleep and obesity and, and lots of, of other things like PTSD and, and substance abuse, et cetera. Um, I think where this is coming from is mainly their practitioners who are facing this, either their patients are coming to them or um, detail people are coming to them and saying you really should be doing this test, plus they're watching their costs really you know, skyrocket. Um, so how we can fit this into their agenda I think is a, is a challenge. I'm not sure it's our challenge as much as to help them, you know, as, as Eric sort of said, set the table for them, show them what's, what's possible and, and if they can make that work within their system, great. If we can provide expertise to help them to do that, we're happy to do that. Um, they recognize that research is not their, their strength. The VA is quite different in that regard, but, but in terms of, of the, you know, the active military services. And again, this is just something we're talking about, but they are extremely interested, which we're just delighted to see. Terry, I had a question for you about the Inter-Society Coordinating Committee for Practitioner Education and Genetics. Where is that material being organized? Where is it accessible? At, at present, it's probably not as accessible as we would like it to be, or it may not be accessible at all. We're still in the organizational stages of this. Where we would like to see it go um, is in the, the uh, I'm going to forget what they stand for, but we, we have two resources, G2, and Laura's going to come to the microphone and tell me, the G2C2 and the G3C, and I can never remember oh. what, the, what the two of them are. So, Laura, maybe you could comment on that a bit. You know, at, at the, uh, oh. I, I, I was going to say, at the intramural branch chief meetings, we used to have this rule that everyone sitting at the table could have a little yellow card, which you could raise when the alphabet soup just got too much for anyone to even understand. So I'm raising my yellow card right now. Okay, is that on now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we have a couple different ways. We are reorganizing our um, health existing health education pages so that when you go to health professionals, you can find your favorite discipline. And then below that, when you go to physicians or you go to nurses, all of the um, information will be organized for you. That will be the broadest net. Okay. In addition, we have G2C2, which is um, genetics competencies, and I can't even remember exactly what the twos are for at this particular moment in time. Um, but that is a place where, again, as Eric mentioned earlier in his director's report, we have four disciplines that have now come together to put together collaboratively across their field through their professional societies, competencies for education, continuing and in training, and then educational resources that are reviewed through an editorial board process that map to those competencies. And that's there now for nurses, um, physicians assistants, pharmacists are coming, and genetic counselors are also already there. We're hoping that through the ISCC work, we'll get physicians into that portal as well. Um, and then G3C is an interactive um, case studies resource where we have videoed um, case studies where you can walk through different choices with a scripted health professional in a setting um, for different specific issues. Right now we're filming six around different pharmacogenomic examples and Howard's going to help with some of those later this week, I think. Um, so we're building that again through the ISCC. We're hoping to work with the groups to bring the case studies that are developed for the for use from the use cases working group into that resource. So I think, and and then we will cross link everything so you can find it no matter which door you come through. Um, but because these two other resources have been developed, and again, particularly with G2C2, where there's um, some professional standards around the vetting for the professional societies to come together, um, that will be perhaps some. Um, more refined materials, whereas on our genome.gov section, we can put up lots of links to different agency resources, to talks on genome TV, to a lot of different materials that won't have the same standard, but where it might be useful for, for people to have. And again, it'll still be organized by discipline, if that helps. So the G2, I'm sorry, the G2C2 is now available on genome.gov? Yes, it is available okay. right now. And okay. as I said, there, right now there are three sets of competencies. Turn, okay. Turn it back on, Lord. So there, there, Laura was saying there are three sets of competencies there currently that have been vetted, nurse, uh, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, and who is the other? Genetic Thank you. We're also exploring with a, a consulting group basically that, you know, 
how we might be able to make this a self-sustaining effort. So, so are there groups out there that would be willing to co-fund it? Um, might we get the societies to help to fund it, uh, those, those kinds of efforts? more thing, Terry, uh, this, uh, this, this talk was really interesting. It just strikes me that um, um, you're playing a really critical role as being a convener and, a, and a getting people to sort of to join together, but there isn't really a structure where this stuff is, is actually going on. And I'm racking my brains trying to think, where could such a structure live? And I, I, I'm having trouble thinking of anything. Bob, it's it is exactly what I'm losing sleep over. I mean, it's exa and it's exactly why when, when Laura and Terry and I went to see Francis and the other deputy director, it was sort of like, this just doesn't feel right. I mean, it's, it's, we're being too successful in some ways, and people are expecting so much of us. And it's sort of like they think we're going to totally solve this with inadequate staffing and certainly inadequate resources. And you feel like it's all very exciting. You get these folks, it's all extremely energetic, and you just feel like something needs to partner with us and sort of start carrying this load. And, and I don't know what the answer is. It's one of the questions I'm sure we will bring to the institute directors when we, talk, when we have our two hours with them. But it's, it's, it's exactly what you were saying, which was making me very uncomfortable, which is why I said to Laura and Terry, we've got to get, an, we've got to get a meeting and figure out. Because I, I would, they were looking to us as if we were speaking on, be, not only on behalf of NIH, People are looking at us like we're speaking on behalf of the federal government, and it's, I just feel like we really can't do that. And not just that, you're speaking on behalf of the entire genomic medicine well, educational a, effort in the country. Exactly, exactly. So I, if you have any ideas, I think you hit spot on I mean, what no, I was feeling comfortable. It's, it's as if we need a structure to partner of, with us. And of all that list that I looked at, um, it's, um, from a practical point of view, I don't know how much sense it makes. From a conceptual point of view, I think ACGME. I mean, they should, they and the CME group really but should be Probably elements on. of it. I think you yeah. can carve out elements, yeah. but I'm talking yeah. about the whole, I mean, maybe, or maybe it has to be broken down. Yeah. But, Laura, do you want to comment? I just wanted to redeem myself with the acronyms. Okay. <laughs> so, G2C2 is Genetics Genomics Competency Center, so the twos just refer to the number of letters before it, and G3C is the Global Genetics and Genomics Community. So, and I'll send, I'll send the links out so we can let everybody know what they are. And Terry and Laura, do you want to make any other comment? I mean, I just went off on what Bob said because I agreed with it completely, but I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, well, I, I think we've, we've found AC, actually the ACCME group, um, even more enthusiastic than, than, so the continuing medical education for practicing clinicians, because remember that, you know, you're only in, in medical school, most of us, for four years, um, and then, and then you're, you have a, a lifetime of practice. Uh, and and so, so that group uh, seems to be, you know, quite eager. Uh, to do this, recognizing that getting CME credits for, for materials has been a major barrier for genomics groups to, you know, to try to traverse. And, and many groups have just sort of given up and, and said, well, you know, we'll come back to you. So they've heard that and they're trying to, you know, lower the barriers for that. But that's a good idea. Laura? No, I wouldn't add to that. I would just say that some of these groups are very eager and I think we're at that tipping point where we now have some, the right amount of material to go forward specifically, whereas before we were talking in theory. And that made it very hard to, to get the momentum to move forward in specific ways. So I think we're about to overcome that. It's a little bit Wait, For deafening. good or ill. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you, Terry. Uh, next we're going to hear from uh, Vince Bonham. Vince is Senior Advisor to NHGRI Director on Genomics and Health Disparities. He's had a direct involvement for, I guess, almost two years now in the development of the uh, uh, genome exhibit at the museum, and he's going to give us an update on some uh, museum activities. 